time to the one who's from everlasting to everlasting. Psalm 90 and verse 2. What's time to him? He's in no hurry. He said no hurry. We need to get to that place. We're in no hurry. Praise God to some degree. We've been like that around here. We would have jumped into Revelation back in the first year of the church. We're in no hurry. We're just taking our time. I'm planning on that, that we've got 50 or 60 or 70 more years to work. So if I wasn't planning that way, we'd be in a hurry. We'd be in a hurry. We'd try to do everything right now and do a bass backwards job when it comes to it as well. You heard me right. I didn't swear or say anything bad now. A bass backwards job. Because we got ahead of God's time. We didn't just rest. Some people think, well, what if we rested so much that things just came and went? Well, so what? You're going to go with them when they went. <laughs> so that's no big deal. What if I'm going to be studying to be a minister, and what if right before it's time to set me in the ministry, then second advent happens? Oh <laughs> so what? <laughs> that means you, God was never preparing you to be a minister in the first place. <laughs> you just were deceiving yourself thinking about that. <laughs> Yeah, we ought, to, we ought to have a lottery for ministers and get most of them out of it because they just shouldn't be there. You ought to pick one in 10 million. Doesn't seem like there are that many Christians that even need ministers. You know, you have to have Christians before you have pastors. There are not a whole lot of those around, it doesn't seem like. True believers. Well, we won't judge before the time. God will, he'll vindicate who's saved and who's not saved. Praise God. Look over in uh, 1 Corinthians 15 about this old wretched Saul who was studying so hard to be an apostle for so long. Look over and see what he said about his life. 1 Corinthians 15. This is a beautiful, beautiful passage. I love the way it's set up here. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory... What I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. See, Paul said I had to be a receiver as well as a teacher. I never would have gotten anything to teach then. Most teachers are some of the most unteachable people you'll find. And that shouldn't be any news to any of us. Because if you know something about your job, then you're probably the type that can't learn anything from anybody else. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are like that. Whatever your profession is, you know about it, no one else knows about it but you. Now that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and he was seen of Cephas, uh, then of the twelve, after that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this hour, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. Poor Paul. We really feel sorry for him about, about that verse, don't we? For I am the least of the apostles. Now, being serious, this is what he thought. We just, he, he's the one who wrote Philippians 2, 2 and 3. Esteem others better than yourself. I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle. This is years after his conversion. But Paul just thinks about his life, his past, what he was like. He said, I'm not worthy to be called an apostle. I didn't get to walk privately with Jesus like the great apostle Peter and, and James and John did. He said, I'm not even worthy to be called that. He said, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Who you are and what you have is a free gift of grace, you see, from Jesus Christ. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. You see, he can't seem to get it nailed down between... God's sovereignty and man's responsibility here, so he gives it to us both barrels both ways. But he ends and begins on God's grace. He said, oh, it wasn't labored in vain. He said, I, uh, given to me in vain, he said, I labored more abundantly than they all. 
But he said, now, let's get the full picture. That wasn't myself. I was a persecutor of the church. I can't claim anything about me laboring for the gospel of God. I labored against the gospel of Christ. So he said, it wasn't myself. It was God. It was the grace of God which was with, which was with me. So you see, we're not saying that you know, your studies and things like that aren't important, but it's the grace of God that you learn what you learn that you're able to. And God's grace is more important than the things that you learn. His grace is what got you saved, not what you know now. But his grace and his mercy and the sacrifice on Calvary's tree. That's the most important thing. Is the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is the heart of the gospel. If that's not preached, there's no gospel then. The death, the burial, and the bodily resurrection. And there is no gospel. Oh, you can preach other things about the gospel, but if you preach other things without that, there is no gospel then. So we're not trying to come against what we're doing the rest of the time, which we did before this teaching tonight, learn some other things. But all that has to be kept in proper perspective. You have to have God's outlook and God's view of these things then people don't strive with other people. They really don't strive with their own life. They're just content that God has blessed them the way that he has. So are you hungering after humility and meekness in your life? You know, when, even whenever we come against these errors and these religious deceptions of men, we, we have to be sure we don't come against people in the wrong spirit. You know, Jesus, he came against the religious leaders of his day, but he never missed God in coming against them in the wrong way. Oh, he told it like it was to them. You have got to take his life for a pattern or you get confused. Well, if you've got to be meek, how could you call someone a snake or something? Well, it must never have been out of spite or personal revenge of his. Must have been, must have been out of pure, true, godly love for the truth and for God and for the ways of God above the ways of men. There's even a passage where you can find Jesus getting, well, more than righteously indignant, as we're told in Mark 10 and verse 14. But back earlier in the Gospel of Mark, in chapter 3 and verse 5, even with anger, boiling over in him he must not have responded in the wrong spirit or he would have been displeasing to god and he said in john's gospel i do always those things that please my father mark 3 and verse 5 and when he had looked round about on them with anger but you see he's angry at their condition at their hard heart of unbelief that's been propagated by the false religious teaching of the religious leaders of his day, not yeah. at them. When he looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the, well, you see, it says there, for the hardness of their hearts. He saith unto the man, stretch forth thine hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. You know, they're doubting that this man can be healed or especially healed on any particular day of the week. They seem to have problems with things like that. So I don't think he ever missed God in his attitude toward people. He's not religiously tolerant like we are always encouraged to be today. But you've got to be able to look on other people. Let me start over. First of all, you have to make sure in your heart you know what the truth is and no one is going to take you from that then you don't feel so threatened by anyone anymore. Then you're not so revengeful or spiteful towards anyone anymore. You want to set the record straight. And you want heaven, earth, and hell to know what the truth about the matter is concerning the word of God and biblical spiritual principles. But no one's going to talk you out of what you know anyway, so why be mad at people? Some people talk like they're mad at someone, like they have a chip on their shoulder. And I trust that I haven't come across in that way because that's not been my intention at all, a chip on my shoulder, but a pure hatred for deception and a love for the truth and a love for making sure the truth is proclaimed. 
Because remember what we used here recently, we can use it again over in Titus uh, chapter 3. I'm not saying being, be tolerant uh, of other people in the wrong sense of the word, uh, but after all, most of what a lot of just nominal church members are doing, nominal charismatics as well, they're doing it in, in, in ignorance. They've never been told what the truth is. You used to do the same things in ignorance yourself because no one had told you the truth. End of verse 2, gentle. Well, go back earlier, not brawlers, gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also are sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts, and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. We were doing the same thing. But we read this because the next verse is connected to it. The next few verses are connected. And it's back to our third point here that you are who you are and you have what you have because of God's grace. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appear not by works of righteousness which we have done but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior that being justified by his grace we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life Somehow, dear friends, you're going to have to come to the place in your life where you recognize there's a medium, there's a balance between Paul, Jesus, myself, the rest of them, speaking out against air, being critical of that. Yet Paul says, I used to believe the same things myself and probably a hundred times worse. Who really has murdered Christians besides people like Saul? Somehow he had to see there's a balance here. That people are serving divers' lust because of their ignorance about God. And you can't hypothesize, well, I know that if we gave them the truth, they'd probably reject it anyway, because maybe God could have hypothesized about you that way and never given you salvation. Well, I know what people are like. If you tell them the truth, they're not going to obey it, so let's criticize them right now. Let me just say something here tonight that I think everyone needs to hear especially well everyone but especially you sisters in the church women of God you should be very restrained with your tongue being a woman of speaking against anyone even a false minister even false leaders I've noticed sometimes just a manly prophetic type sharp tongue against this fool of some minister. I don't know, if I were a woman, I'd, I'd want to know what the truth is myself. But I'd want to have more composure. You know, to the perfect woman of Proverbs chapter 31, it said of her that in her tongue is the law of kindness. Have you heard before the old saying that if you can't say something good about somebody, just don't say anything at all? It's very close to being totally scriptural. I guess I'm saying that, that, that there should be more of a distinction maybe in your mind between what I come and preach to you here about some particular doctrine or issue and how you relay that to others that you come into contact with. I just think about myself and I don't know if I can paint the picture. I've got a perfect picture in my mind of what I think that it should be like and what I would want to be like. I'd want to hear the truth and hear it just like it's supposed to be preached. But then I wouldn't want to go away with just a fiery spirit about me because I think whenever you get in that area, you're going to lose your meekness and your kindness and your gentleness. Do you understand what I'm saying? Amen. That you could be gentle. You could say about that person who you don't think as a brother because they're really in deception, well, praise God, I just don't think that he's right. That really comes across good to me. Now, if you ask, well, why don't you do it that way? Well, why didn't Jesus in Matthew 23? 
Why didn't he say, well, the Pharisees, just not the best. No, he didn't say it that way. He said, you are vipers. So, again, we've got to understand some medium or why do we have both opposites presented in the Scripture, both extremes presented, unless there's some medium in between. I think it would really speak highly of a person, male or female, especially of a female, to just with, to refrain, withdraw, I guess is the word I'm thinking, her tongue, refrain herself from speaking evil against anybody for anything. I mean, in Titus 3 and verse 2, he says, speak evil of no man. So you've got to be at least close to the truth. You couldn't hurt yourself not speaking evil of anyone, since after all, that's what Titus 3, 2 says, speak evil of no man. Don't be a brawler, but be gentle. Show all kindness toward all people. Uh, and I hope you're hearing the whole picture of what I'm saying. I'm not just saying, well, you know, this watered down weak form that if you can't say something good about someone, then don't say anything at all because everyone's pretty good after all. That's not really what we believe. We believe that people are in gross sin and grievous error and leading God's sheep astray. And, and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and the, and the apostles of old said they were examples of this, and they said God is going to have his faithful shepherds and ministers who make sure that the flock is delivered out of the jaws and the bank accounts of these false ministers out there. You have to have someone who will tell the truth. But even the person who has the responsibility of telling it like it is has to be sure they realize that they themselves at one time were serving divers' lust, false doctrines, heresies inspired in the pit of hell. It's just true of everyone. Do you believe false notions about God? So who are you to be criticizing everyone else if you don't number your own days and recognize your own limitations and your own past life? Like Paul said, I'm not meant to be called an apostle, not because I'm not good today, Paul said, but because I remember my past life. I persecuted the church of God. So it ought to do something to the heart of hearts on the inside of a Christian. To think, you know, there's, I'm hearing meekness in this. Somehow, if you're like me, my heart always responds to meekness. I don't care who it's from. I'm always amazed when I meet someone who condescends, who speaks highly of others but not of themselves. I'm always amazed. I like that person. I really do. They may be a good heathen friend before it's all over with. If they've got that type of attitude to them. Because you just don't find it very often. People always want to speak about their own good deeds. As we conclude, let's turn over to Romans chapter 12. We don't even have time tonight. We've been going a long time. We don't even have time to get over into Proverbs and look at those really heavy verses like let another man praise thee and not thine own lips. Back to Romans chapter 12 and verse 3. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Not to think or to speak or to act, but to think soberly. Soberly. That means you number your days. That means you admit your limitations. To think soberly. Quit being intoxicated in love with yourself. Think soberly about yourself. You've got mistakes. You've got faults. They're not supposed to remain forever because of your love for God and your hatred for sin in your life. You're supposed to zero in on that and get rid of that in your life. But you're not perfect. Even if you don't have faults that you think you can recognize, God can, we can. Just ask us about it. Ask your husband or your wife about it. They'll tell you. That's right, they'll tell you. You've got faults. You do. Yes, you. The one with the halo over your head. I'm talking to you. You've got faults. Someone can tell them to you. And if we can't, God can't. You did something with the wrong motive or attitude. 
Every week you do something with a wrong attitude or motive. God knows your heart. We, want, we ought to want to purify our hearts by faith. Get rid of these things out of our life. And especially just rid ourselves of pride and boasting, the old boasting mouth of the heathen that boasts great things against heaven. But you can't accomplish very much. A fellow who can run the 100-meter dash the fastest in the world, well, God can be at the start and the finish at the same time. So he's not too fast. You know, when you put things in God's perspective, he's not too fast. Your hound dog can outrun you. That little mud of yours, your cat's quicker than you are. A cat's fast. <laughs> He's got your finger nailed before you know it if you play too long with him. <clears throat> yeah, a little tiny critter. <clears throat> Get out there on an open roadway and take off running. Your dog, your horse, an old dumb zebra. <laughs> He'll outrun your car. And man thinks, oh, 100-meter dash, X number of seconds, Whew. And the whole world bows down before him as athlete of the year. He's a piece of foolish clay and dust is all that he is. And you think about God can be at the beginning and the end at the same time. Yeah. He thinks that he's fast. What a fool, you see. Anything. I've always been critical of these beauty pageants. Most beautiful woman in the world. <laughs> There is a heathen somewhere in Africa <clears throat> who's more beautiful than you are. Just because there's nobody in the church doesn't mean you're the best-looking woman in the world. We don't, have, we don't have others to compare to you around here, so just because you're ahead of 10, that doesn't mean you're ahead of anybody. I mean, you've got to think soberly about yourself. I'm pretty handsome after all. <laughs> Well, you look like a dish rag compared to a really handsome man. Really handsome. You're either too fat or too skinny or too bald or too much hair or it's like a wire brush or your feet are flat, your fingernails you don't ever keep cut. <laughs> well, we can find something. <laughs> we can find something out about the person. You're not so good after all. But you know, it's so good to remind yourself of these things. You're not the world's best at anything. You only come close in the area of sin. That's the only thing, because we all have done that very well. <laughs> you're not the world's best at anything. 100 meter dash, I'm still sure I could find some aborigine somewhere who runs down antelopes for a living for food. <laughs> He'll outrun these guys. You know what I'm talking about? This is so foolish, the world's best anything. He runs down zebras for his food for breakfast that morning. And this guy that went to Syracuse University on a scholarship thinks he's the world's fastest in the world, you know, or something. No, that's foolish to think thoughts like that. Not until you've checked every person in the universe. Those departed spirits as well, check them too. And check the maker of us all. You need to consider our maker. Then we limit, then we'll, we'll see our limitations. We'll limit ourselves like we should be limited. And we'll recognize what, what life and what godliness is all about. It's only when you really can recognize these things in your own life and in your own heart that God can begin to work on you. So guard against pride and arrogancy in your life. Watch your tongue against anybody. But especially I'm talking against about false ministers, ministries, or those that aren't false but miss God or something. Receive the truth. Be able to communicate the truth to others. But don't take pride in the fact that someone else has fallen and missed God. Satan, dear friends, is the instigator of all of these deceptions anyway. He's our enemy, not flesh and blood. The only reason they've made a mistake is because of our adversary. He's the one we ought to be angry at, not people. But who calls them to fall? It was the devil. He's our common enemy, not one another. Not other Christians. Not other deluded Christians. So I'm, I'm not saying we're going to water it down. I'm just saying we ought to have, uh, what can I say, a semi-tolerance to us. Total tolerance in our heart. We're tolerant. We can live and let live. 
They're not going to influence us. They're not going to influence our family. If we have the opportunity to set the record straight and to tell the truth like it is, we're going to. But, oh, when it comes to your heart, blessed are they that mourn over other people's failure and, and, and the lack of, of them being able to comprehend what you comprehend. <clears throat> because we ought to want to live a life, the Matthew 12 life there, where people can see and hear Jesus in you. You know, if people can't, if you can't, as time goes on, and as time has gone on, hear and see the Lord Jesus in me that I'm, I'm doing something wrong, I'm missing the mark somewhere. Because that's what it's all about, to live a, a transparent life where people just see Jesus in us. That's what makes people want to follow God anyway. It's when they see Jesus, they understand more about Jesus. And what the Lord God requires of us, what he wants us to be like, what he wants us, the blessings that he wants us to <clears throat> fellowship with him in, that he'll give us in this life, that he'll give us in the next life as well. Our goal shouldn't be after having a mansion. I don't want to have a mansion, <clears throat> fancy cars, exquisite clothing, but to know Jesus and to know Jesus crucified. And to get all of, all of what we know and what we are learning in its, its own category. Now, everything is, is interrelated, but understand how everything relates to everything else. I'm, I'm closer in my life now to walking out of the ministry than to looking for a big door to open up where I can have greater ministry. I know, I know. I was telling someone on the phone the other day. <clears throat> I just know that I'd be totally content. As long as it was God's will for me, I'd be totally content working nine to five, doing, I don't know what, digging ditches, just so I'd have the privilege of coming home to my family and having dinner and opening our Bible and praising our, our God and our Savior. I'd be totally satisfied. Totally. What else could you ask for in life but to know the God of the universe who's beyond knowing, beyond comprehending, whose ways are past finding out. But he discovers himself to you. So we have to make sure we're in this for the right reasons. We're in this for God's glory. So he can get glory out of our lives. Not so we can get glory, but so that God can get glory through us. He must increase, we must decrease. I don't know what the future holds for us, but I know what type of work is being done in some of our hearts around here. Hallelujah. And I don't even know what else I'm supposed to say or can say about this whole general area right now, but I guess it really fits into the whole topic. You ought to want to be known above everything as a man or as a woman of God. Just a man of God, a woman of God, one who loves God and who God has taught how to love people as well. Love's the greatest thing. I think I read somewhere in the Bible. The greatest of these is love for God and love for your fellow man. Love. Love not in word only, but in deed and in the truth. 1 John chapter 3. I want you to get a, a freshness, I guess, again in your life through all of this. There's a blessed verse over in uh, Psalm... 84, I believe it is, that um, the psalmist said that I'd rather spend the day in your courts, just a day, than a thousand anywhere else. 
In other words, he's talking about life and death. If I just had a day to live, I'd rather live a day with you than a thousand days anywhere else. A thousand days. That's, that's three years. He took one day over three years because the one day would be spent in joy and freshness in the courts of the house of God. You do some considering back on your early Christian experience. I really think you'd be blessed. I really think that would be God's will for you. Do some considering over the next few days on your early Christian experience of how exciting everything was for you. Now you have to get the children ready, and that takes a lot of time, and keep them quiet. Before, you didn't have to do any of that. Just shout and praise God. Just because he's given more blessings, that's what they are, blessings. Doesn't mean we should, well, this is getting really hard on us now. So what if God gives you ten children? Would you rather just be a woman in the basement with ten children than a woman with none and the head of a corporation? I'd rather hear just two sentences out of the message than to hear none at all. Amen. That's for sure. You've got to have your, right, your attitudes right about all this, and everything is a blessing to you then. You, look, you can look at everything, a sunrise or a rainy day, and what a blessing, praise God. Hallelujah. Everything will be a blessing to you then. Amen. Instead of we get ourselves so lifted up, only concerned about ourselves, everything has to go our way. Instead of you just take one day at a, at a time, as Jesus said, you're grateful for everything in that day, everything about that day. You know, be like the people that even the world talks about, that you know how to get everything that's possible out of one day. Live each day to its full extent. Instead of just passing it by as Thursday, Monday, just another day. It's a day that you're saved, that your heart is clean, that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. It's a day for you to be so grateful about so many different things. There can be nothing in old Mother Hubbard's cupboard, but praise God, there's something in your heart. There's faith and joy and victory and, and there's salvation in you. That's what gives you, that's what just gives you your victory in your life. It's not memorizing verses. It's not quoting Psalm 91 every morning. That is religious bondage. It doesn't do anything for anybody. Not in my opinion. It does nothing for no one to get up. Where does it say to do that in the Bible? They just loved God and lived with him and for him every day. They meditated in his word. Day and night took the word of God and used it to their advantage against their problems and against their enemies and so forth, their adversary, the devil. But they didn't have any system of proof texts memorized. 